Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock and this is another talk on philosophy, German thought, existentialism, and Heidegger, specifically. One of the core thinkers important for German and French thought, and thus world culture, art, and a whole lot of everything in modern popular culture. Last time I was ranting and raving about the context of Heidegger's ideas, about how we're thrown into a world as an open and closed being in an open and closed world, and how Heidegger himself was plenty a Nazi. So his ideas are important, but he also has been shunned by many. But I do believe perhaps Derrida is a little too excessive in saying, hey, his philosophy and his politics are totally unrelated, but at the same time, and has been accused of such, but at the same time, I'm going to teach people the core ideas of Heidegger because whether or not he is a fascist or a Nazi, and Sartre, who is going to come very soon next, is a open communist and, and plenty of Stalinist, whether or not any of these people were of their political parties is not important or not for me teaching their core concepts as one leading to another leading to other thinkers today, of course. So we're going to get into this. If you want it, the con context of Heidegger's thought and how I like and dislike it, please see the first talk. But this is a talk now concerned with getting through the core concepts of Heidegger. And essentially, it is what we finished up with last time. We and our world are open and closed, which is very like the Taoist yin yang. And Heidegger was talking to Chinese students about Taoism in his years teaching. And yeah, while also and or being a card carrying Nazi. So let's get into the notes and the concepts. So Heidegger says and asks in the beginning of Sein und Zeit, uh, which again, I think I just screwed up or not. From 1927, his first major work, he says, How do we experience reality before and as we arrange it? What is the ground of being that supports our views and values? We approach the world, each other, and objects, either as closed and identified or as mysterious, uncanny, and miraculous. For Heidegger, industrialization and technology, this is very existentialism. Industrial in modern times are very much a bad thing, kind of for existentialism, that is somewhat cool but killing our spirit poorly. Postmodernism is remarkably not so pessimistic. It's more like, well, your spirit is kind of neon and computer and techno, but that's just sort of life now. Pes industrialization and technology being bad is very Heidegger, and that's sort of or not Nazis, plenty, both sides. But that is very hippie also to be somewhat uh, industrialization and technology have kind of disenchanted the world is what Heidegger says. He says, industrialization and technology have disenchanted the world. He doesn't put it that clearly, and certainly not in English. And so we must question the world and re-enchant it to live authentically. This is another thing like Dasein and the Horizon and another and Le Petit Orgea of Lacan. To talk about Heideggerian authenticity is to enter into a world of pain, according to Mr. T. Like, you're just asking for people to call you wrong. But authentic existence is one of the core... Heidegger wants kind of people to be more authentic, but he sort of doesn't suggest it's good or that you sort of can. It's very Kierkegaardian, and he is very mysterious about what authentic existence exactly is. But there are a lot of people who are very opinionated about that. It does seem like he's suggesting something good, but he also seems to talk as if we just have moments, kind of like Schopenhauer, where we melt into opera and suddenly our, our ego death clear. Heidegger sort of suggests almost like authentic existence is accidental and just kind of happens to us and we can't intend it. Very much like ego death moments, except for Heidegger, it's kind of evil Buddhism because those ego death moments are kind of like for Sartre. Those ego death moments are actually moments of horror in which you realize how little power you have. And that this has fascinated Japanese philosophers who are familiar with Zen for a while in German and then existential thought following German thought. There's kind of almost evil enlightenment moment where yourself is taken away and you realize how meaningless and crazy this all is as a moment of Heidegger and Sartre and others. What is authentic existence thus? Well, we have to, in a certain sense, take a leap of faith, as Kierkegaard says, and choose for ourselves in an increasingly manufactured world. So, and with Nietzsche, science is turning the world into something like Safeway or a grocery store. That is somewhat a truthful world that is also thoroughly mixed with lies. Think about how truthful a supermarket is and how much full of lies and exaggeration it is, all as the same exact stuff interwoven. Clearly, you could point to this or that part of the product or label, but 
that. Think about how much a, super, a supermarket is truth and is lies together, and now think about how Heidegger would look at a supermarket and not think it is as authentic as making your own cheese curds and, like, cottage cheese. You know, with the butter churn or what have you. I don't, clearly. You know, I don't have the uh, $200 Japanese uh, automated butter cheese curding machine. I should, though. But... I am an improper German again. I'm a white American. So we need to essentially question the world, re-enchant it, because all of this technology, this is very Poe, this is very existentialism, this is very Nietzsche, this is very Dickensian London with soot and orphans. Like, the modern city world is kind of a horrifying place. We don't want to go back in a certain sense, but we kind of hippie-wise want to, and so we need to live authentically. All of that is in the background of what's going on with Heidegger here. And then describing it more particularly, you can notice if you're already following along why Heidegger kind of doesn't want to say what the self is in particular. Neither does Buddha, because they kind of want you to sort of get away from and kind of also find yourself somewhat. And yes, that saying, I had a hilarious conversation with my friend Adam um, recently in which he said that his small daughter, uh, that she was, that uh, that they were describing some philosophy to their kids, and his daughter was like, they were like, you know, in order to find, Buddha left in order to find yourself. And his daughter was like, yeah, and she's like, I believe she's like six, you know, I, I think, maybe, I haven't seen her in a little while, it is the pandemic. And she's just like, you know, and and she's like, she reminds me a lot of my, uh, she looks a lot like my sister when she was very much younger. So his his daughter amuses me greatly because she is like my uh, sister in younger years. And she's just like, find yourself, but he's right there. You know what I mean? It's like, as a small kid, it's like, you don't know. And of course, this doesn't mean the concept is simply silly, but I do love that. It's like to a little kid, it's like when you explain, I, they're finding themselves. The kid would be like, you know, what are you talking about? Like, I don't know, but you're there, you know? Isn't it cool? Like, I don't get it. Like, I mean, you know, that the child sort of doesn't know enough to know a human being could sort of lose themselves yet, let's say, sort of, or hopefully, yeah. So, with all of that, you living authentically is something like finding your true, calm, real self, sort of through the pain and the misery and the terror with Heidegger and Kierkegaard. It's something like that. But as soon as you try to pin it down more, of course, people will jump all over you and tell you you're mistaking it, or you're trying to pigeonhole it, yes? Because, of course, anything it could be attached to or nailed down with is something it could get bound up with, yes? This is very much like describing the ego in Buddhism in certain ways. But it is something worth describing because it's not a non... It's not a complete nothing because, like with Hegel, it's a particular type of non-being. Like, it's a particular type of lack that Heidegger is describing as central to existence, which is that lack and openness, good and bad, are central to existence. I go on and on about how Taoism and Zen are into that. I love that stuff. That's what Heidegger was starting to paw at as a Nazi. I have a good friend, um, uh, just like my friend Adam. Uh, friend Mike uh, used to be a Heideggerian in this town uh, with uh, and doing philosophy and stuff. And he had an example back in the day when uh, we were hanging out the of dropping the soap um, in the shower by yourself, not in a prison. And uh, that's a different whole situation. That if you are in the shower, a lot of times you're not paying attention to the soap. I oftentimes, now myself, I say as my example, I say Taoism would really have you pay attention while you tie your shoes. Maybe the Buddhists would have you meditate and stare at a wall. The Taoists would have you pay attention while you're tying your shoes or anything a little bit more. Maybe you suddenly, hey, I didn't realize I'm screwing this part up a little bit. Something like that. Dropping the soap is a good, bad example. There's an example in Taoism of there's a man who goes in the marketplace. I've told this story in the Taoist and Zen talks, I think. He grabs the gold. He sees gold. He grabs the gold. He tries to run with it, which gold is heavy. The cops catch him, and they, they ask, why did you go grab gold in the broad? It's like you pulled a robbery without a mask in broad daylight, pal. Why did you do that? He said, at the time, I just saw the gold, and I wanted it. I didn't think about anything else. I didn't see anyone else. That's very Heidegger. That's very intentionality structuring your reality. That when you see something you want, everything else isn't there. Like a, you know, like, oh, you. And then there's just like the person in the spotlight. It's a David Lynch and scene. The, that there's everything else melts away or disappears. And then you have, David Lynch is a very existential, shubab, shubab, uh, beatnik-ish filmmaker in many ways. And is glorifying, I would say that. The existentialism and the beatnikness of it and glorify and enjoying the kitsch. But with all of that, that the idea here with the dropping of the soap 
or seeing of the gold versus paying attention while you tie your shoes or not is that mystery and truth for Heidegger, which is very surrealism 101, and mystery and truth appear only in the cracks of our industrialized reality when things break or go missing. Heidegger actually looks at soap. The reason it's good to bring up the soap and dropping it in the shower, you're thinking about your great aunt Judith, you're thinking about all sorts of other things you have to do at work, and then you drop the soap and now you're thinking about the soap for a bit. The soap was there. I like doing this with Zen Buddhism now because the Zen Buddhists like doing things like, okay, so this is peripheral, but you're listening to me talk, so this is peripheral over here, you're still experiencing it, and then suddenly there's a problem with it. He's like, oh, now you're paying attention to that. It's with the soap, it's with the gold, it's with the stuff. You are hearing your reality a lot, but you're actually paying attention to one thing right here, and this is meh, 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 I don't have kids yet. I have cats. But yeah, it's like this, 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 this. I have the truck outside and other stuff like that. And then, of course, you do or don't notice when it is or isn't there peripherally. That's a lot of what's going on here. And what's also going on is the moral kind of, although, again, we're, we're there's lessons here which aren't hard morals written down, which is that mystery and truth increase as Heidegger is looking at packaged soap. Heidegger has two moments here, which are important that, that match. First of all, the reading often suggested is uh, Heidegger. The question concerning technology is a fundamental essay of Heidegger. Easiest Heidegger, simple piece to read. Heidegger is looking at, I forget if it's in that piece or not. Actually, I've, I've taught about the piece and other things for a while now. He's, uh, there's two instances, I believe one, the log bridge, I think, appears in the technology one. He sees a log bridge over a river, and then he sees an industrial lumber mill. Now, for Heidegger, the log bridge, kind of, the log fallen over the river and kind of people using it as a bridge and it worn away is more, he doesn't say this, because again, you can't pin it down, but in a certain sense, he thinks that the Greeks, like for Nietzsche, the Greeks kind of, and the ancients lived in a more mysterious world. I think of hippies and tribalism, of course. I have seen, when I was younger, in my earliest years, I saw teepees and more than one white dude uh, wearing a Native American headdress before, you know, uh, commodities. The, uh, the basically, of course, with all of that, trying to live authentically. This is, there's Germans apparently who try to live as Cherokee in Germany and then real Cherokee online are like, please stop doing that. They, uh, that, you know, just do what you want to do. Just please don't call yourself and say like, we're Cherokee now. And they take it real hardcore. It's like, and try to be like pure authentic about it. It's like, dude, no, that's not your, you know, you can't really do that authentically as replicated. One of the things I mentioned with Baudrillard and other stuff that's good to teach here, if what, what Baudrillard is going to ask as a French guy at the end of all of this, much more towards, he died in like 2005, I think, like around when Derrida died. When these French guys are going, Baudrillard wanders around Tokyo and says, what I would tell you is if you, and I love my folks and my family and my upbringing, if living uh, open existence is something like hiking a well-defined trail in REI gear and in nice hiking gear, we don't really live in a mysterious world anymore, even when taking hikes, if you understand my drift. The ancient people lived in a world where maybe there's jaguars or not, so when you take a hike, it's life and death. Now, on the one hand, we wouldn't want to go back to a life and death, there's jaguars, oh no, but we, uh, Aztec, uh, Mayan mothers apparently, sorry, Mayan mothers apparently do, are baffled why, when uh, uh, city-dwelling mothers wonder why Mayan mothers let their kids play out where there's jaguars and snakes. The Mayan mothers are like, how do you have a bathroom with so many industrialized chemicals in it in your house? That's crazy. Like, that, that just is frightening to them, industrial chemicals and things like that. Which, think about how much power, cars whizzing up and down the street. When cars and death are whizzing up and down the street and they just don't notice, you know, and it's not really death, mystery and truth only appear in the cracks of reality such that Baudrillard is like, I'm effectively a nihilist, but I don't want to be because after Tokyo and after a bunch of shopping malls, how do you do anything other than hike a well-defined trail in REI gear anymore? Is Nietzschean individualism even possible? And these are the rantings of a Frenchman having gone to Japan and thinking a lot about Nietzsche and Heidegger. If you get some of the ideas of Nietzsche and Heidegger here, you would understand why Baudrillard is wondering, is individuality or meaning even possible anymore? And here I am talking to you on YouTube, so I think it is. But is YouTube cheapening meaning? Is advertising cheapening meaning or is it just doing more that is a very good question that this is all getting into with postmodernism. and here it is that if you drop the soap that's the only time you think about the soap it's only when i screw up in snapping that i would think about this as i do it for an example of peripheral for you because as i'm doing it okay i do not need to think about it i just go through the routines and i'm thinking about what i'm talking to you about in fact i'm making my emotional point and the words jump up and rise as nietzsche says under my feet and my emotional point 
because I'm trained enough in monkey words and talking the English such that I can just jabber away and make my emotional point and I don't arrange my words with rules or with thinking because that would be thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking and it would be an infinite regress. The fly in front of the face. And yes. My, uh... So yes. Essentially, this is kind of... Now, as we are in a day of right and left wing kind of revolutionaries, let's say, Nazis, of course, want to rise up and overthrow things and create a new crack and rupture of society. Bataille is very much into how fascists, as well as everybody, want rupture and break and something like that. So Heidegger is very much, very Nietzsche, very jungle, very dangerous here, suggesting that it is only when we kind of rupture or have uprooting of our industrial reality that we have a lot of meaning, and we can have social meaning when we uproot reality and, uh, and reveal what is concealed. And all meaning, according to Heidegger, which is a great thought of his later thinking, that every revealing is a concealing, that we are constantly revealing and concealing things from ourselves. So we need to uproot things, but we need to uproot things constantly because we are seeing and not seeing things. He did not see that coming, yes? A little Nazi joke. Acting! You know, tiny Nazis. Yeah. Heidegger says this is like a forest clearing. Forest Hartman. A forest clearing is an open space that is also obscured, uh, revealing what is in it while also obscuring what's outside. If you think about how the self and Dasein uh, is something where there is a horizon... You see and don't see what is coming and not coming as yourself and your reality. You are somewhat like a forest clearing where you do and don't see what is uh, increasingly obscured by the trees and outside what is clear and in your purview. Yes? For Heidegger, being and beings withdraw from us as we try to grasp them. They are more mysterious if we really dig into it, which is why commodified soap, he's looking at the commodified soap with a package label, and he's like, I don't really trust this, and I feel weird and anxious about it. Because commodifying reality, notice how even though he's a Nazi, this is increasingly important for modern times, opposing commercialism and culture and things like that, and beauty image, magazine ads, feminist performance and uh, art, etc. All of this stuff is going to become important for like rupture, for breaking patterns, for revealing as concealing. A lot, I love surreal movies and a lot of things going on. For Heidegger, um, it is similar to Merleau-Ponty's later insight we'll have that we only partly perceive our physical reality around us and he gets very into that in cool ways. For Heidegger, time continuously gives us the present as it takes the present away from us. Again, he would know, although not in the accented English as I do, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. For Heidegger, time and being, which effectively, pantheistically, if we're talking that way, and or is tool of God, you know, would be time giveth and time taketh away. Being and time giveth and taketh away. In a certain sense here, time giveth and taketh away beings is actually what uh, Heidegger is very much saying. And meaning is always thus historical, and thus would have particular placement and not be entire and universal, would have what Heidegger calls historicity, which is kind of like personal individual subjectivity, but social, that you would have the zeitgeist. The spirit of the times would be how being in time is very universal-ish, but also particularly rooted in these problems and particular situations. One of Hegel's great contribution, contributions to philosophy was looking at thought as a historical process. For Heidegger, being is always bound up with time, and thus his title, Being and Time. Time is the horizon of being, is what he says, which is why think of it as an ocean. Think about that you are going out looking at the ocean. Time is the horizon of being. The ocean, time, this is very Taoist, and the turtle to the, uh, the frog to the turtle to the sea. The well frog is a very famous Taoist story, which is perfectly awesome to tell here, that there is a turtle, perhaps tortoise, again, differently uh, enabled in the elements, and uh, passes by a well with a frog. He says, hey, nice pad you got here. Frog's like, yep, uh, I love this place. And the turtle's like, well, have you seen the sea tortoise, perhaps? Sea tortoise. And the frog's like, uh, what are you talking about? And he says, it's a bunch of water like this, but it stretches on forever without any boundaries. And the frog's like, BS, man. I've been living in water my whole life. Comes in a tube. You are some fool. And mocks it. This is very much a Aesop grasshopper ant kind of thing. Is, and we are told, 
that the well frog and the insect, the summer insect, are not are not going to migrate south in the winter. They're going to die. They're never going to have that perspective. We're told sadly. So that is very much time is the horizon. You look deeply through history. Think about how Heidegger is doing Neoplatonism as well as German thought and a bunch of stuff. And he can see that how I can tell you doing ancient, medieval, and modern thought will show you a lot about how people think about being in similar but different and situational ways. It's kind of amazing. That is exactly what Heidegger is dealing with and thinking a lot about. As time and being are seen and unseen, so there can be no absolutely grounded judgment, interpretation, or meaning. Care and life are always as much for oneself as much as for something else that never fully arrives, just as we never reach the horizon. This is also Le Petit Orgea of the Petit Object A, which I'm trying to say in the French all pretentious, like a jerk. A jerk, yes. A jerk, eh? No. No. That... We uh, we are trying to grasp something in life we can get a full handle on. This is very symbolically for Lacan, Le Petit Orgea, although people will correct me entirely on that, I'm sure, and I don't grasp it at all. And that is very much kind of the golden... Uh, people have said the in the orange golden light, possibly, of the, of the screen and California and the, and the Hollywood that's in the briefcase of Tarantino's Pulp Fiction is possibly steal, uh, Marcellus Wallace's glory or also something of a MacGuffin and something of a good example. And uh, Tarantino likes uh, wandering into body stuff as well as French fine cinema and funding. That it is something like a petit orgea, something like an ungraspable and he does not reveal what's in that thing. And it is something like open power and glory, which would be something like stolen from a gangster which is then brutally stolen from him, his pride and glory. I will not mention how, yeah, if you've seen the movie. But... That g glory and honor, that golden light, which is neither good nor bad, is a very Nietzschean, kind of Heideggerian, kind of Leconian, Petiogea of the stuff of life, the energy. It is neither good nor bad, nor but the fire of existence of Cal... And it's very easy to read that a little bit too much into that, but the simple contours of the ideas lend itself very much to that. If you're into French cinema and playing with Heidegger, then... and. Tarantino is, then revealing something in a briefcase that would glow but be mysterious and not shown is a bit of, we never reach the horizon, we never fully close reality, my reality just keeps going this way and this way, I never fully close it, my concept, I love telling people in the name of Wittgenstein, you don't have a full concept of apples, your idea of apples is open-ended, that's something that's not obvious, it's scary. It's like we're trying to grasp it. Lakoff and Johnson from this town say that you're trying to grasp we, uh, across human cultures. So many cultures say grasp as idea or word or grasp as idea before they have idea concept as words. Because we just try to grasp things we never fully grasp and what object do you always have in your hand that you always grasp. This is a lot of the deeper thought going on here that time and being are like that. They are closed but are open. For Freud... Thought is typically denial of our impulses towards sex and violence. For Heidegger, common inauthentic thought is, in a sense, denial not of sex, but the other most popular one, death. Death and taxes, uh, sex is not, unfortunately, inevitable. We prefer to think of ourselves, others, and our thoughts, and our world as fixed, closed, and immutable. This is Hegel 101. Hegel's logic tells you this. Heidegger, a lot of Heidegger's work in Being in Time can definitely be seen as structured by Hegel's logic, I'm convinced, and people who do deeply know do know that of German thought. You can see the parallels here. Hegel tells you... We start with bargain, basement, square, stupid, rat as rain, facts or facts, ma'am, which is why I constantly discourage people from simply thinking science is just authentic, it's all or objective, it's all good, we're done, and then say, please take your vaccines and trust the experts, you know. But at the same time, the average idiot thinks there's facts. The average idiot thinks there's closed things. It is harder whether or not you become a Nazi, yeesh, to think of things as open and closed in the brilliant ways that philosophers and psychologists do. And this is very core Heidegger. All you have to know here is that most stupid people are going to try to cling to things as completely closed. We are playing with several forms, with Hegel and Nietzsche and Heidegger, that are open but also closed, both contradictory-wise. Thus, they're alive. If you understand that, things are open and closed, but they're also thus alive and, and we're at issue with them and have problems with them, it's all you really need to get here at base in order to understand what Hegel introduces in history with history. But then Heidegger takes much more Nietzsche. Oh, we're talking passionate logic then. We're talking about emotionality in human beings and intentionality with Husserl. 
we're talking about how we're open and close to others in our world and the horizon and apples and the light in the briefcase. That's what you're talking about. Yes, like that's basically that we don't fully understand apples. So apples are open and closed to us. Our idea of apples is not fully done. So our idea of apples is open and closed. The world and how your visual realm of horizon, think a horizon is a visual thing, yes? It's also a tactile thing. But it's, for human beings, very much a visual thing. You think of the ocean or mountain view or something like that. In your own vision, you can see and not see it receding away, right? So you see and don't see the horizon right in front of you. It is open and closed, thus. You don't see what's going to come over it or around the ridge. That is all, again, something like things being open and closed. And how does it make us feel? Emotionally conflicted in all the feels, right? That's... N that's Nietzsche rolling into Heidegger Lacan French Thought 101. If you understand what I just mentioned about the openness and closure and the emotionality of all of that, of you, the things you hold in your hand or think about, like the Democratic Party or apples or anything, or your concepts, which are not perfect, and then your world. And if you understand no expert ever has had perfect concepts of apples or, or any political party, then you understand what we're being, I'm, I'm using the simplest of words because there's a lot of complicated German and French words that are trying to get people to understand that. Once you understand things are open and closed, known and unknown, which is Christian mysticism and ancient thought all over the world similarly, which is why Heidegger's into Taoism. If you understand that things are being and non-being as becoming, that's Heraclitus, Nietzsche and Heidegger's favorite Greek philosopher, my favorite Greek philosopher. Things are being and non-being as becoming. They are in transformation, so they're solid and not solid as in process. If you understand that's the self, that's the world and its horizon, that's everything you've ever experienced, everybody you love or hate, and all the social movements, the institutions, and the apple and pears you can hold in your hand, you understand in a very simple, well, simply worded way, what a lot of complicated German and French thought is assuming you already get because they're assuming you've already done your uh, Greek thought and other stuff and are an interesting person and deep man and then it is very German to say you come to the well when you're ready I don't tell you much of it you drink as deeply as you want and then from the fire hose and then you have to come and rise to me that is one of the things about uh, German academic types from Germany, which definitely I have to say is it's much more America. Okay, make with the fast food. Okay, tell me about Heidegger right now. Germans are like, you should understand it when you understand it. And they will not stoop down to your level at all verbally. I'm more American and pop. I'm like, meh, you know what I mean? I think it's not as useful and pragmatic. With Wittgenstein, I like simple pragmatism and simple pragmatics. So long-winded Heidegger is not as useful. It's better to boil down his basic concepts into ways that people can understand. And what you need to understand is we're always emotional and anxious for Heidegger towards the world. We're constantly concerned with death because our world is open and closed and we look down the horizon. So here we have, we, it is, uh, we are in a basic state of anxiety towards our world that extends over the horizon just as we are afraid of particular people and objects. So it is very core existentialism and core modern art to understand that we are basically in contradiction and, at, and not at rest with ourselves. Why? Because objects and the world are open in ways that we're constantly afraid of and cannot close up. If you want, and that is a never ending Sisyphean task. That's very Buddhism 101. And how do we handle an impermanent world in which everything is given, but everything is constantly taken away, like a never ever evolving treadmill of sorts and the treadmill of the horizon? How do we deal with that? And the answer in Buddhism and German thought is very much develop, like Schopenhauer said, as a Buddhist, he called himself, develop sea legs and a tough st uh, stomach. Because you love and hate life anyway, so develop a good, tough stomach for loving and hating life like you do, and love and hate it well, is very Nietzsche. And he thinks Buddhism is too pacifistic, smile, you know, and just kind of meditate and melt Schopenhauer into it. And Nietzsche says, even beyond Schopenhauer, stand out and, like Faust, sacrifice yourself for knowledge and for the great, and do, uh, hopefully do not do awful and the worst. No one will find that justified, you know, even if, plenty, they'll find it mixed at best. But do what's pain to get the gain 
and again, face the openness of death and the horizon and the world and the change and fight your way through it to, rem to get better at being human and to be a more authentic individual. That is how I will interpret it, and I do know many Heideggerians interpret it differently. At least they would have issue with each and every one of my words. It's hard sometimes to talk to strict Heideggerians, which is why I am not one, uh, very much. I really like Nietzsche. I always did, as an undergrad, prefer Nietzsche to Heidegger. But I understand why some of his core thoughts are very important for French Nietzscheans. So you do need to under... If you like Nietzsche and you like French thought, French Nietzscheans, you do need to understand some Heidegger. It's very... Uh, his view is very beautiful and very interestingly Buddhistic and Taoistic. I don't think he's ripping that off either. I think he gets that from Christian mysticism, so maybe ripping that off in them. But I think as a German guy who's into Christian mysticism, Nicholas of Cusa and other stuff, I think he actually does then come to Taoism already understanding plenty of what Taoism sort of is trying to say and wants to get even more of that in China, which is my kind of thing. Again, I'm glad I don't live in those times. Yeah, but we live in interesting ones here and in China instead. Nietzsche does give Heidegger much of this, um, he says we cannot, we can't ignore the void, think Kierkegaard, leap of faith, and whether or not you want to leap into the void, by turning to absolute immutable morality. We can't, we can. This is again why with Nietzsche I dwell a lot on not believing or believing in science a lot. Because what Nietzsche and Heidegger are suggesting is that, and I really do think this, and this is the challenging thought, people who are not religious, whether or not you're religious, we have opportunities to trust religion or science or politics with our lives and meaning or not, and that is always open-ended. Let me leave it right there and not... I usually go after science because it's the most believable, but this applies to everything, of course. And if it's all human, then even though many people are more analytic, no, you can separate math and science apart from the rest of human reality. If we're being very much that all of human reality and all institutions are human all too human, then you are in an open, painful situation of trust and distrust with institutions and meaning in your life. That's what this means. That's what it's basically saying, and that's very true. I come from California, uh, hippie, kind of therapist, post-Freudian land and family. That's very 101 to that stuff. And so Heidegger's thinking, and then later French thinking and other stuff, was hip during the time of all of that development of stuff and the 60s and things. All If you're into the 60s, therapy, art, all of that stuff... The Heidegger is supplying some core thinking here, which is kind of, and Freud is also supplying some other ideas at the same time that are different, but both inspired by Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Hegel before both of them. So, and that the drive is to create individual meaning. Although for Heidegger, he says it is also decently social. Heidegger makes this stuff decently social, and that actually is good and bad because, again, he is card carrying Nazi and took advantage of that in his times. Heidegger thinks that we basically have to stare, like Nietzsche, nihilism and the open void in the face, the, the danger of losing all meaning to fear, anxiety, and all that, which is what fear and anxiety show us, meaning being very much taken away. And we need to uh, accept uh, becoming in transformation. With Sartre, I'm going to mention this involves other people. Hell is other people. That's what this, uh, that going back and forth with others specifically. For Heidegger, out of the basic state of anxiety... For Heidegger, it's again kind of evil Buddha. We are not at peace deep down. Deep down, we are actually anxious. And that deep anxiety out of that is where love, fear, rejoicing, suspicion, and all sorts of different ways we interact foundationally, open-endedly, not structurally, systematically, but foundationally for our world. So understand here, he wants to do psychology such that he doesn't want to give you a system, but he wants to show you what are the powerful moves of your reality in your life. Yes, thus are the structures and your reality in yourself. True freedom is realizing all of this and gaining it in your awareness of your actual life and gaining self-conscious transparency that as you're tying your shoes, you see you're doing that rather than it's opaque to you what you're doing, which is weird, tricky language and would have to be teased and lived further out, yes? Notice how he could be accused of being a charlatan and so can plenty hippie therapists after the Buddha and gurus and stuff. But it also is stuff I do believe in. It's not entirely wrong. It's just the tricky, <laughs> the devil, and very much is in the political parties and or the details, right? Either upper or lower levels. We must reduce, we must resist reducing ourselves, our truths, and even objects as closed and ready to hand, Heidegger says. Think about the more modern, commodified world and how it's increasingly safe way stores. I don't want to keep saying Safeway. That's what I went to as a kid. 
you know, as went to Safeway myself, um, wherever your Rite Aid uh, kind of, you know, Walmart, whatever your major uh, market um, convenience store, you know, uh, supermarket is. That's a good symbol of the supermarket is ready to hand this. We need to resist ready to hand this. And then, of course, now people will be like, is your Brooklyn, you know, grocers collective authentic or not, jerk? This is, of course, kind of end your facial hair. Uh, with all of this, this is kind of the issues, yes? You get what I mean? The spectrum of how authentic can you be and why, and is that just selling out in a hipster way? Can you hike in REI gear and be authentic or not? This is all of these kind of issues you can freely think about, probably pretty competently once I've laid these uh, lines in front of you, yes? In his famous essay on technology, The Question Concerning Technology, notice Nietzsche and Heidegger are seeing technology go off. They don't know of environmentalism yet. These are people who don't understand what, I mean, they see environmental destruction. Heidegger sees the industrialized lumber mill and he likes the log falling over the creek. He doesn't actually know we may or may not run out of trees. He's not considering that at all. And whether or not, I'm not going to get into whether or not you feel about that, because again, I am avoiding teaching this to particular political minded people. But he doesn't even know about those issues yet. And he's still, and he's of course being like, oh no, you know, there are Mongolian Nazis, by the way, who are really strongly pro-environmental and nationalist environmentalists uh, in the name of not exploiting Mongolia for Mongolians. I'll leave that there. You can look it up on Vice, Nazi Mongolians. And yeah, it's kind of amazing. But with all of that, of course, and like uh, nature hikes with blonde children or not, you know, with Hitler. And again, he liked dogs a lot. So... Considering the difference between chopping down a tree oneself or chop shopping for plywood at uh, the Home Depot Lowe's store, if we, we kill the world in a certain Kierkegaardian Heideggerian way, to put it in a phrase uh, phrasing here, we kill the world and ourselves continuously in the attempt to avoid death. But if we accept death and meaninglessness, we are free to choose how we live our lives and give our lives meaning. That's what authenticity kind of is, and you kind of can't do it intentionally with this or that object so easily, right? If we realize we are running off into the woods to avoid being lost, we can learn to dwell in the woods, which are scary, but home comfortably as our home. Heidegger actually does call this dwelling. That it's almost like being enlightened is learning to dwell. It's a good, simple, of course, that's a translation, but I like single syllable words now as much as possible or two syllable words. I try to simplify things, simple anglophonic words, for anyone in their language, of course, I mean, whatever language, dwell is a good, simple word, yeah? It's not, a, it's sort of too down-tempo for a nightclub, you know what I mean? Like buzz or what have you. But dwell is like, yeah, it's not really a workspace either, it sort of makes me want to go to sleep. But as again, I want to burrow as a mammal with the fox den and cuddle and, oh, and like just snuggle and uh, snore until they wake up and bite me again in the face. So for... Well, they bite me repeatedly, so yet again. For, uh, with all of this stuff, Heidegger talks about dwelling, that we are trying to learn how to dwell, which means not getting very into Taoism and Zen. You're not getting rid of the ego, you're not getting rid of the jerkness of others, you are learning to deal with it well. You are learning to swing the sword well, and then put it away. You are not learning to ditch the sword forever. That's not actually what you're doing. That's very much learning to dwell, balance, not ditching anything entirely. Awareness, transparency, very Zen, very much in line with all of that. Unfortunately, Japanese nationalism was also uh, problematically into Zen and Americans got decently into Chinese Chan as Japanese Zen from fighting World War II and other things with beatniks, uh, hippies after that, etc. So actually, Again, this is why I teach the full rich history, but do not teach you this does or doesn't result in you becoming a nationalist, of course. Gotta tell you all of that. Yeah? Yeah. It's neither the good nor the evil thought, any of it, you know? And is the thinking more on my side? So I'll just tell you the Kantian moralists and others, they, have, they pick their sides too, of course, all over the place. For Hegel, to recognize being as non-being is to understand becoming. For Heidegger, to recognize we are world and everything and everyone in it is enclosed but remains open and alive is to live authentically. To get what one truly wants, one has to accept and encompass its opposite. For Heidegger, there can be no metaphysics, either platonic forms of the cosmos or Kantian rules of the mind, such as Leibniz's rules of non-contradiction or sufficient reason. For Heidegger, there can be no complete theory about how theory is possible. That is a very good one worth bringing up again. And 
I will say this is for Wittgenstein, the loose toolbox. We have a loose toolbox. We add tools to it. It isn't a complete system. Think about how a toolbox is a rough system, but not really a system of stuff you can use that you just amass that doesn't have an underlying consistent system of rules of how a hammer and a screwdriver fit into the system. We just amass it. Yes, it's a good concrete instance. There can be no complete theory about how theory is possible. Notice philosophy and ideas are themselves open and closed and remain so without complete closure. Rupture, constantly. Yes, revolution, constantly. For Germans who didn't get one. This is terrible news for philosophy. It was hoping to be complete and with Kant. Again, the Anglophonics love their Kant and love science. But good news for philosophers who want to always have more to do and thus continue to eat if they find employment in the first place, yes? Like Nietzsche, Heidegger argues that things can always be variously interpreted and as can the process of interpretation itself. Heidegger calls this hermeneutics, which is a term originally used to refer to religious interpretation of the Bible and Quran and other and Jewish texts, etc. Heidegger is using a biblical like hermeneutics, which is like what scholarship was very much about religion, of course, in plenty of cultures the world over. Hermeneutics is how we read and interpret texts. That is a very popular word today. You will hear the word in academics hermeneutics a lot. That is, again, because it means inter uh, methods of interpretation is a fancy word for that. I like reading now. The word read, like uh, to read, my reading of this, I'm going to give this a read, is a way of saying something like hermeneutics, interpretation, uh, methods of interpretation. I would say, simple, read, single syllable, again, root word. Heidegger argues we cannot fully understand our understandings, nor would we want to. Now, this is another thing. Nietzsche and Heidegger do mention Whereas some part of us wants to be Kantian and be the fox that wanders out of the cage and then goes back into it to burrow in the cage and be all boxed up. Notice again with Nietzsche, the Apollinian and the Dionysian, we do and don't want to be boxed up. So we do and don't want to live in this falsified scientific world, according to Nietzsche. That would be the vaxxers and anti-vaxxers and all of this stuff in complicated layered ways. Not just that that's the two sides entirely and everybody's putting gas in their car as they are struggling, I would say anti-vaxxing is a poor way, because I'm not an anti-vaxxer and I'm not into it, is a poor way of people struggling with the openness and closure of science. If that mystifies you as to how anybody could be there, understand we will probably have ranges of people all over the map. That's actually the robustness of our species life, that we don't all go off the cliff as lemmings. Think about it. As far as zoology, anthropology, we mix it up as human beings. That means you can't get everybody to believe in science or religion, and one religion or all of science entirely, that results in new science. That results in new thinking. That results in new systems. New religious movements is a particular field of study, and I know a, lot, a decent about new religious movements, but we'll leave that where it is. Uh, Mormonism, Rastafarianism, things, de religions developing with planets, other things in, in the modern world. All rooted in ancient thinking. Um, so the basic way that we are in the world is only partially articulated by judgment, logic, and language, only partly controlled and explicit. Like self-contradiction for Nietzsche, this is both a good and a bad thing. It is good when it is authentic, which you kind of have to just find your way into and can't plan thus, yes? And you can push this in that way that you feel. It's very Socrates. Push towards what you want, but plan it entirely how could you, or calculate. You wouldn't want to, or completely automate. It is, but it's bad when it's inauthentic and dishonest. Um, our reality is unclear, not fully determined, which is what makes choices meaningful. Only the articulated part of thought that is occupied by our focus of attention is at issue for us. Our being, which Heidegger uh, calls Dasein, is again thus open-ended. We are constantly projecting ourselves into the future and interpreting ourselves in terms of the past. Dasein is often thought of as an individual being, but it is in fact any identity an individual takes on, a they in which we participate. This is why, actually, one of the things that's annoying about Heidegger is if you say Dasein is your individual self or an ego, people will say, no, wrong. And the reason is, is because, although honestly I would have people be a little bit more generous with their understandings of how we can use words openly, yes, I shouldn't necessarily jump all over you if you say ego or Dasein and act like I know you didn't technically use it right if I'm being generous in a conversation rather than combative and uh, co in competition with you, right? 
in the flow and back and forth of things. If you say Dasein or Ego, uh, and look at me nervously as many have, I'll just give you a pass. Say, sure, you know the self, whatever. But for a lot of people, these are technically different kinds of aspects of self or something like that. Because Dasein is any sort of social self. We already had that with Fichte, if you find that in that talk. That's, you have a social ego and self. So you're, you're, you, if you're listening to this in English and you are a native English speaker or whatever your language is, you understand and talk to yourself about yourself in your native language. So you are a very social individual self. In fact, Heidegger actually says we are more the one, which is often called the they, and then people haggle about it. Dreyfus haggles about that. He calls it the they, and then people go back and forth about it. The one is kind of humanity, the they, you know what they say. We are actually, Heidegger would say, and it's interesting to consider, how much are you an individual versus how much are you a collective sheep and just like everybody else and using English words like everybody else, or words, let's say words, like everyone else, feeling fear like everyone else. You don't feel special kinds of fear unlike anyone else. What the heck is that? Uh, Wittgenstein would say, do you see special kinds of red that you describe to yourself? What sort of weird social individual identity do you have? You only know how to talk to yourself and others in terms of social words, so you don't know many kinds of red never described unless you want to weird me out. So in a similar way, you don't have many kinds of fear you've never heard described. You can have all sorts of ranges of emotions. It's hard to tag and bag or label anything you don't have people helping you out with with words, so no matter how ingenious you think you are, we're mostly, Heidegger argues, the they, we are mostly the them more than our individual selves each and every day of our lives. In fact, if the best thing I can do is hike up a nature trail by myself in REI gear, that's like other people I have seen breaking on through to the other side counterculturally a bit, right? So that's the problem with Baudrillard in the, in the Tokyo shopping malls. How do I do anything authentic if there's hot topic now where I get pierced? You know, or, well, I mean, in legal ways in this state. Oh, and or that I get, you know, I am, uh, can you dye your hair and do YouTube now and be authentic? You know, much love. Well, if everybody does everything, sort of, you know, and mixing and matching and mixing things up is still, after thousands of years, the way that people do it. Heidegger also, like Wittgenstein, places very central emphasis on language. Um, we learn to define ourselves using whatever language we use. Children learn culture and language without the need to fully articulate it as a system of explicit rules. I will go on and on and on and on about Wittgenstein. Dreyfus, who taught me, I took two Heidegger classes with him, is that uh, Heidegger's thought is very similar to Wittgenstein. Both of them are very much similar to plenty of pragmatists in that they are trying to figure out how language and emotion structure our reality. So am I. That's a lot of my thinking about Poe, Lewis, Carroll, and other stuff. Dreyfus used a example, as I heard other philosophy people, John Searle, I'm not the fan, of them use the same example of that if you are Anglophonic and if you go to a conference with English and German, with Brits and German professors, the Brits keep backing up, the Germans keep kind of charging forward, which of course is kind of a war reference, old war wound, and the Brits want more personal space. The Germans don't want as much personal space. So they're kind of marching around the room like a scene in Mean Streets where the guy's fighting by backing up around the room continuously. They're kind of like, and so it's it's cultural understanding feeling, which is what a bunch of Berkeley uh, Berkeleyans, a bunch of Berkeley professors who taught me were dealing with, how do we get this into the thinking here in exist in existential uh, in psychological, let's call it, kinds of ways where how close I stand to you or not and how comfortable I feel is part of the background situation psychology of how we make meaning, truth, culture, and all of that. It's the endless dance of the Brits and the Germans. Yes, I call it our inner selves as Anglophonic folks. Um, so yes, it's again, and we avoid speaking of the French. If we live in a culture in which women do not wear pants, if we did in a more traditional ever, uh, women never do, this literally goes without saying until a woman is seen in pants, which then angers and upsets traditional people who only then articulate the practice with judgment as a rule in language. And then you have backs and forths about whether or not women can wear pants and all of that I use as a problematic social example. Zizek, the uh, popular uh, later thinker, cynically uses the example of actually explaining how you're doing to an American waiter when they ask how you're doing because you're only supposed to say, oh, I'm good, happy smile in America. You're not actually supposed to tell them anything about your day because then they look at you all scared because then they're afraid of intimacy. So 
Heidegger uh, is setting the stage for the Frankfurt School's fear of a culture of the culture industry and commercialism, which they consider to be the new highly evolved form of fascism. That said, that is a second talk on Heidegger. This will work itself into, and it's a good idea to break this off here because we've been doing the horizon. Now we have to get back a little bit to the self and self-interpretation falling and fleeing. And that will be the subject of the third talk. I do know I have a lot to say and interpret here because even though I'm not so into Heidegger, I do know there are many important points to slowly go over before I start making references to Heidegger and saying, remember Heidegger in the French thinking, because they're going to be inspired by moments of all of this. So let's cap this at the second talk. We will have a third and final talk on Heidegger about how human being is essentially self-interpretation, which is going to be very Lacan, surrealism, and art all around you all the dang time already. Yeesh, with the pop surrealism and the modern art and the stuff that's been kicking for the past over a decade uh, plus uh, in this area, etc., so much love, much happiness, and much over the horizon that is pleasant to you as you stare over it in perpetual anxiety for Heidegger, unless you develop the baby bear theory slight smile of the Buddha, as I would say. Much happiness to you, and plenty more of the horizon, good and bad, and that is life, dear fellow. So much happiness, much horizon, much love, much being, much time, much sight, and I will see you, if I ever do, ever see and not see you if you did not see that coming.